Ning, if we could get a roll call, please. Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Here. Councilmember Botorf. Here. Councilmember Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. And Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. All right, I'm going to start us off with my uh, little opening statement here. In accordance with the current shelter-in-place order from Santa Cruz County Health Service and Executive Order N2920 from the Executive Department of the State of California, this council member is not physically open to, excuse me, this council meeting is not physically open to the public. As you can see, limited staff is physically present, present in council chambers and council is participating remotely via video call. Members of the council can use the reaction choices in Zoom to indicate they would like to speak, similar to raising a hand. As always, this meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast, at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website and with the Zoom meeting link also available on our website. Our technician tonight is Benjamin Thompson. Thank you again, Benjamin, as always. Despite being physically closed to the public, participation is still possible. Public comment can be emailed or called in. To email comments, Identify the item you wish to comment on in your email subject line. Emailed comments will be accepted starting now until I announce that public comment for that item is closed. Each emailed comment will be read aloud for up to three minutes or displayed on a screen. To call in comments, before the item you wish to comment on, call the phone number uh, displayed in the meeting. Enter the meeting ID 8210902 Press the hash key when prompted for a participant ID. To raise your hand and make a comment, yes, to raise your hand uh, and make a comment, press star six on your phone. Wait to hear that you are unmuted and then make your comment. You have up to three minutes to speak. If you are watching the meeting via Zoom, you can use the participant option to raise your hand and make a comment when unmuted by our moderator. Emails and calls received outside of the comment period outlined will not be included in the record. And as you can see, the email to provide public comment is displayed on the screen. As mentioned in Zoom, you can raise your hand as a participant. And if you are calling in, dial star six to raise your hand. We're gonna move on now to item two, a report on closed session. All right, so Sam Zutler, our city attorney, I think has her hand raised, but I think I can do the report out from closed session is that the city council reviewed the items listed on the closed session agenda, which included meeting with employee negotiators, myself and Larry Laurent. Uh, the city council gave direction and took no reportable action. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional materials for tonight's meeting? Yes. There were 64 emails regarding item 8A and one email regarding item 8E. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has one change. Um, item number 8D, the zoning code discussion. Staff recommends continuing that. Um, it was noticed for tonight, but due to the length of the agenda, staff recommends continuing that to June 11th. Do you need a vote on that, or do you just need us to uh, agree to that continuance? Um, why don't we vote? Okay. Right now? Yes. 
I'll move that we continue uh, item 8D. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Story, a second by Council Member Bertrand. Can we have a roll vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Botorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank Motion you. carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. We are going to move on to public comments. Now is the time for comments on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. If you would like to comment on an item that is on tonight's agenda, um, you will raise your hand or uh, weigh in once we reach that, that item. So now would be the time uh, to determine if there are any public comments on items not on tonight's agenda. And we will start uh, by asking the city manager if there are any emailed public comments for tonight. We don't have any public comments received to the public comment email address. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our moderator, Larry, do we have uh, any verbal public comments? I Maybe. do not. I do not see any hand raised for public comment. Okay. Looking also, and I do not see any either. And and um, Larry, you would know if the um, if anyone calling in by phone had had unmuted themselves by now. The, I, we've instructed them to use the key, this believe the star six to raise their hand oh, so uh, in order to do that. It would show up as a raised hand as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, with that, we are closing uh, public comment. We're going to bring it to city council and staff comments. Um, I would like to, to speak briefly first. Um, we received word um, from, from one of our previous commissioners, uh, Nick Ruth, informed us yesterday of the um, sad passing of a former uh, city manager, uh, manager Sorrell. Um, Steve was hired with the city of Capitola in 1979, and he was with us for 14 and a half years uh, before he left Capitola in 1994. Uh, during that time, he made the development of the Capitola Community Center, the New Brighton Middle School Gym possible. He helped acquire the Ritson Mansion and the Clares Wharf Road property and was known for his open door policy and accessibility. After leaving Capitola, he uh, moved to Hermosa Beach and worked there for 18 years and then retired in 2012. In his time in Hermosa Beach, he oversaw development of their Pier Plaza, downtown municipal parking lot, and the revamping of the Hermosa Valley Park and the creation of the new South Park. There, he was known for his enthusiasm and his love for community. And I know that uh, Council Member Bosworth uh, has experiences uh, that he would like to speak to with uh, former city manager Burrell also. Council Member Bosworth. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Steve Burrell was, uh, was the, when I uh, got elected, you know, he was uh, relayed to me as the uh, magician of Capitola, and so I took it upon myself to fly down to Hermosa Beach and spend a, spend a day with him to try to figure out what made Capitola tick. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, just a warm, friendly, inviting man. And, uh, you know, he laughed because I said, what was the trick to getting everything done in Capitola? And he said, you know, he, he laughed. He said, yeah, I just had a city council let me do what I wanted. And uh, we all know that that doesn't work that way. It, these days anymore. So uh, he lives in a time of redevelopment money and he did many, as you mentioned, many wonderful things for the city of Capitola. And uh, those things are still here and, and part of our, of the lower Capitola. So uh, uh, for me, if it's okay with uh, the mayor, if, if you're pleased, I would like to have a moment of silence for Steve Burrell. Absolutely. If we could all please take a moment of silence for Steve Burrell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue with uh, council and staff comments. Uh, if any council members have a comment, please raise your hand. I see that Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up and then we'll go to council member story. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. I just have two items um, that maybe staff can bring back. Um, I've received a couple emails regarding the, the river. Um, and I know we've talked about it a little bit and just getting an update on that and clarification on where we are. 
Um, and the second one is regarding parking for businesses, um, not necessarily on the Esplanade. The county just passed um, a variance on the permit process for businesses who have parking lots in order to use, utilize their outdoor space um, for, for dining options. Um, I'm thinking of restaurants and other businesses on 41st Avenue. Um, and I was hoping that our staff can look into that and see if that's something of, of a need in our, within our city limits here. And that's all I have. Thank you. I can do both of those things. The, for the, the creek closure, we'll talk about that more on June 11th when we talk about the budget. So we can bring that back next meeting. And then the, um, you'll be hearing more about some of those ideas about other uses for private parking lots later on in our presentation. Staff has been working closely with the BIA and we have some proposals for this evening. Thank you. All right, we'll go next to Council Member Story and then to Council Member Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, actually, Councilwoman Brooks uh, brought up the um, a question that I was going to ask uh, about um, having on next uh, regular agenda a discussion of uh, closing the lagoon and grooming the beach. Um, so I think that that's already going to be a part of our budget discussions. So I'll just um, look forward to, to uh, discussing it then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, um, being forgetful at times, um, I'd like to put this suggestion to the City Council and um, staff that in the meeting minutes, it would be called out specifically as a separate item, suggestions that any council member made for future agenda items. So that when we review the meeting minutes, we would see specifically if a particular council person made a suggestion for a future council uh, discussion. And I know I've made suggestions in the past and I forget them. So this way it would be a little bit easier for me and maybe everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, if there are any further council comments? Seeing none, does staff have any comments? I think Nikki Bryant, our recreation supervisor has one comment for this evening. Great, thank you. Uh -oh. So we'll just have to uh, unmute Nikki. I believe that we can do that uh, from the host end. There we go. Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council members. Um, I have two comments. One, uh, the public may notice the community center is being tented for uh, termite fumigation over the weekend, um, taking advantage of the fact that there's nothing uh, going on in there. We decided to try and get this um, urgent work done. And um, the second comment is, is that I wanted to encourage public both that have registered for summer programs as well as might be interested in registering for summer programs that we do have scholarships available and that we would love to see individuals that would maybe benefit from a scholarship and benefit from being part of summer programs to go ahead and apply. Um, and like I said, that's for people that are already registered as well. I know that sometimes individuals may just make the decision to tighten their belt strap and go ahead and, and splurge on summer programs, but we do have scholarships available in order to serve the public. So I'd encourage people to apply. Great. Thank you so much. Any additional staff comments? Not at this time. All right. Thank you. Uh, seeing none, we're going to move on to item seven, which is our consent calendar. Uh, all items listed on the consent calendar will be enacted in one motion in the form listed uh, on the agenda. There's no separate discussion on these items unless any of the council members or member of the public would like to pull an item for separate consideration. So let's start uh, with our moderator. Has there been any member of the public that has raised their hand? Uh, and also, Mr. City Manager, anyone who has emailed in indicating that they want to pull an item from the consent calendar? I do not see anybody. I do not have any emailed public comment. Okay, great. Uh, with that, is there any council member that would like to pull any item from the uh, consent agenda tonight? Seeing no one raise their hands, uh, then we will entertain a motion. I'll move the consent calendar. 
I'll second. It's the same. Moved by Council Member Bertrand, seconded by Council Member Story. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand? Aye. Council Member Batorf? Aye. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our general government items tonight. We're going to start with item 8A, receive an update on the city's pandemic response, and we will turn over to staff for a staff report. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Let me see if I can share my screen. And Okay. So the item before you today right now is the uh, update about what's been happening with the city and the region's uh, COVID-19 response. This is the, I think, fifth in a series of updates we've been doing at every council meeting. Um, remind folks that on May 26th, the county health officer issued a new order that allowed for many activities to resume in the county, allows for in-person retail and some office spaces to open, and it aligns the county of Santa Cruz with the California Resilience Roadmap um, which is the state of California sort of reopening plan for the state. The beach closures do continue um, and there's no change to the beach order nor to the facial covering order. The facial covering order requires individuals to wear facial coverings when they are in indoor public spaces and when they're outdoors and social distancing cannot be um, maintained. The County Board of Supervisors has a special meeting planned for tomorrow to file an application with the state that would move the county, our county, into the later phases of, um, later portions of phase two. What that means most specifically is, is that restaurants could be open for in-person dining. Uh, it's not, that doesn't happen when the county takes action, it happens when the state certifies that application. And I don't know, I don't have any inside information about whether that would happen within hours of the county taking action or whether it's a longer timeline, like potentially several days. Uh, I think that's the key updates on the regional status. Um, overall, we have 205 known cases, I think maybe 206, I thought I heard on the radio as I was coming into this meeting in the county. Um, we have the two deaths. We have seen a, a somewhat of an uptick in the last 10 days from the cases. You can see here that our cases were trending down towards many days with zero new cases and several with one. Um, the last 10 days, the cases have definitely increased to some degree. Um, I do know that County Health has been employing their, their tracers to try to get a handle on the, the spread. The spread has been predominantly in South County, uh, not in the northern parts of the county. Um, I don't know if our city attorney has been able to join us, but did you have anything you wanted to add, uh, Sam Zutler, uh, on state activity? I'm here. I, I, I joined. I don't know if you can see me, but I can see you and I can see the presentation. Um, no, I thought that was an excellent summary, and I just reiterate what you said about um, the county has applied for whether or not we can have outdoor dining depends on the state's determination on the variant for which the county has applied. My understanding. I think from county council is that they're being that the variance requests are being processed pretty quickly um within a day or two is my understanding so hopefully we'll get that back soon and can move into outdoor dining and deeper into stage two great thank you uh samantha okay so uh some other local news is is that save live santa cruz county is a partnership between the county and the community foundation they've launched a website with safety uh, information about how to moving forward in this pandemic um, the city's open facilities uh, we do plan to open city hall next week and we're calling it a soft opening that we're not going to be pushing it out too much the idea is, is sort of one at a time in the lobby and we'll see how it goes police department remains open one at a time in the lobby um, the city parks are open with the exception of the playgrounds, play structures, those are closed under the public health order, and the wharf is open. Uh, the beach does remain closed from 11 to 5 every day, the community center and the museum, and then um, the beach parking lots, including Tri Cliff Drive, are also closed. I do want to also mention, I'm sure for some of you who are here in town, you definitely have seen that the enforcing the, the beach closures has proven a challenge, particularly in this week. Uh, Capitola isn't alone in facing this challenge. 
I know that the, the chiefs for all the cities in the county with beaches have been meeting and talking and it's been growing increasingly difficult to maintain the closure during the day. Um, more and more people are willfully violating it and if, if our officers aren't physically there, um, it seems to become a problem. So that's gonna be a challenge for us moving forward. One of the things we touched on last meeting was we kicked off our business recovery efforts two weeks ago with, um, with naming former city manager Rich Hill as the city's business liaison. The business recovery committee met today, uh, this morning to discuss ways that the city could partner with local businesses to help um, reopening and help facilitate the reopening. And they, they had a bunch of great ideas and suggestions and I think I'm gonna turn this over to Katie who is gonna talk more about the different ideas that are being proposed by the BIA and this business recovery committee and looking for council feedback on that, um, which I think is gonna be the big item on our agenda together. And oh, the last item is, is that the city also co-hosted a webinar about so your payroll protection loan got funded, what now? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie Herlihy, who's going to present sort of some of the ideas that have come out of the Business Recovery Committee and the BIA uh, so that we can get council and community feedback on them. So Katie, are you here now? I, I am here. Um, and what um, I need to do is I need to stop sharing my screen so that you can share your screen. Okay. And if that proves challenging, let me know and I can pull up your presentation here and run it for you. Thank you. Um, can you see my first slide, business recovery? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Jamie, and good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, before Tonight I'm gonna give you an update on our business recovery efforts and in our preparation of moving further into phase two. Um, tomorrow, as Jamie stated, the county will be filing a request to move further into phase two, and that means that restaurants will be able to open in the near future. Um, staff has been working closely this past week with the BIA, and also we had a meeting this morning with the Business Recovery Committee to develop concepts um, to help support local businesses. And I'm gonna bring you through, uh, to, uh, present two of those, the two major concepts that came out of those two meetings. Um, the health official has indicated that when the indoor dining is allowed, that outdoor dining would be a great alternative um, to complement the indoor dining to give patrons other options. Also with the current beach closure, the order allows seating on the streets and sidewalks except for the areas adjacent to the seawall. So as we start talking about the village and what can be done there, just keep in mind that um, the areas adjacent to the seawall are areas that people must keep moving um, under the current order. So first, out of the uh, this is more um, out of the business recovery meeting this morning, we discussed some ideas, and I've also been discussing with our regional um, community development group um, what other jurisdictions are doing to help businesses throughout the county. And one of the ideas that has come up is conversions of parking lots for business uses. So in areas such as private plazas in which uh, there's a lot of parking, um, allowing restaurants to utilize part of the parking to, for outdoor dining. Also for religious institutions um, to prevent crowding, to allow religious institutions to utilize their parking area to, for um, additional seating and possibly putting large TVs or screens outside for um, the religious institutions. Another idea that um, we've actually had one application through Zelda's is uh, restaurants wanting takeout windows so that there's a separation between the um, people coming in and out of restaurants and then being able to queue for to-go orders. So um, allowing takeout windows and also conversion of outdoor spaces for business uses. So this could be something like a, allowing a outdoor display as a, if, if it were allowed under the guidance. Um, and then other physical modifications to business. So as other industries open up, um, we can start looking at what, what needs to occur in terms of development to help them succeed. 
So the idea here is to streamline some temporary planning, planning permits um, pending the emergency order. So the city would, would create some standards for each type of um, allowance and then applications rather than going through our entitlement process in front of the planning commission, which typically takes um, from anywhere from six weeks to sometimes up to two to three months, um, applications which comply with all the standards that would be in, put in place could be approved administratively uh, through, through myself, the community development director. So that's one idea. The second option um, is street dining option. So you've received um, a lot of emails today and yesterday regarding this um, two concepts for the village. So as I stated, I worked closely with the Capitola Village BIA this past week, uh, and they've come up with a concept for the village. And as well, there was a, a member of the public, Dennis Norton, a previous council member and a local designer, came up with a second concept that um, has been circulating through the community. So I'm going to present both of those options to you and the highlights of those options, and then um, we'll, we'll be looking for direction on all of these items. So first, within the Capitola Village BIA concept, um, the main difference between their concept and the uh, second concept is it maintains access through the village by automobiles at all times. Um, it will replace public parking adjacent to restaurants with outdoor dining areas. So along the Esplanade where we have a line of um, restaurants, all these public parking areas in front of those restaurants would be converted into outdoor dining space. Um, it also creates additional curbside pickup areas. So in creating their plan, they've identified multiple curbside pickup areas to help those retail businesses as well as restaurants where there'll be short-term parking for um, patrons to park um, and go pick up their goods and then they can easily go on their way. Um, and then also parking is only removed in areas for outdoor dining and curbside pickup. Um, the other remaining parking spaces would not be removed throughout the village. They're, they're also requesting that the city increase the parking limit. Right now it's at one hour um, to increase the parking limit to three hours. So if uh, people came in to dine, they would have adequate time to have a meal. And also opening the parking, knowing that um, there'll be over 50 spaces removed under their plan, to, the request is to open parking along Cliff Drive and the upper lot at Zion City Hall. This is a map showing the concept. So the areas in red are the curbside pickup. And as you can see, they're um, placed throughout the village strategically so that there's curbside pickup close to pretty much every retail um, area within Capitola. Also, there's curbside pickup located at the end of the Esplanade um, with the, for folks that do not want to dine in, that having the ability to drive through the Esplanade and pull over for the curbside pickup there. Um, outdoor dining is shown in blue. So what they've done here is they've created outdoor dining for every restaurant within the village. So along the Esplanade again, where there's a continuous row of restaurants, this whole side would be um, closed off within the existing parking areas for outdoor dining. At the Mercantile, there's a larger place for outdoor dining, um, and that would be shared with the ice cream for Marianne's ice cream on the corner. Um, on San Jose Avenue, um, curbside pickup and outdoor dining is proposed, and that would service to, to the wine bar as well as the restaurant. Um, and then as you come up Monterey Avenue, there's again um, dining areas for each of the restaurants as you continue up Monterey. Under this concept, pedestrians would stay on the sidewalk. So the, there'd be continuity in front of the Esplanade restaurants. Um, ADA is a major um, concern when we're looking at modifying any type of circulation within our public areas. So the ADA and um, pedestrian safety would be maintained on the sidewalk. And then as I stated earlier, in this concept, the car, um, all parking that is not just 
displaced by dining would exist throughout the village, as well as the car would be able to travel through the village at all hours. So under the second concept, vehicular access would be um, allowed through the village until 11 a.m. After 11 a.m., um, the entrance off of the Esplanade from Stockton would be closed, and only there would be an 18-foot wide passageway that would be maintained at all times for emergency vehicles. So if there was an emergency, it could reopen. But after 11 a.m., the idea is no vehicles would go through the Esplanade, um, leading through the Esplanade as well as Monterey Avenue until you get to Capitola Avenue. Um, the, again, under this concept, all public parking adjacent to restaurants would be converted to outdoor dining. There would be, under this concept, a little more room for the outdoor dining because it takes away the parking as you're going into the Esplanade on the left-hand side of the road. And by maintaining that 18-foot-wide path of travel, it just it, there's more, um, more space for the dining to um, creep into the road and not just be in the parking areas. Um, and thirdly, limited access and parking on San Jose Avenue is proposed. So the mercantile would have access to its parking and then the idea is to limit the parking on San Jose Avenue to allow parking for the hotel as well as local residents. Um, and then all parking on the Esplanade and Lower Monterey Avenue would be removed. So next I'll go to the map to show you what this looks like. So here in black you see the outdoor dining that's proposed. Um, and for, for each of the restaurants throughout the city, throughout the village. Um, the residential and hotel parking is shown in blue, and that would be on that segment of San Jose Avenue. Um, there, the road closures are shown in red, so one road closure at the entrance to the Esplanade. And what that means is that from 11 a.m. Um, through, the, through the rest of the day, the the car would not be allowed through the Esplanade, this last portion of San Jose Avenue, there would be a barricade here, and um, until you get to the Capitola Ave Monterey intersection. So here I show the available, where the car would be allowed within this concept, and that again is just on that portion of San Jose Avenue, and then the um, Esplanade route and Monterey Avenue would be open for pedestrian use only. So, and then there would be an emergency access maintained within this concept. Um, also, we've been, I've been talking to the BIA about design and infrastructure, and um, the Capitola Village has always been an area in which we've taken great care of any development to kind of fit within the charm of our beautiful village, and in order to section off the dining area along the Esplanade and that long contiguous area, we thought it would be um, uh, a cost savings effort to move our benches back down into the village and face them inward toward the dining um, to kind of think, to separate the cars from the dining area. So taking our existing benches, moving them back down, and then bringing a nautical theme to it through use of um, some nautical rope to um, connect the benches behind. Um, and then also utilizing separation between the restaurants with sanctions. So, um, and then potted plants and really uh, creating an overall infrastructure for, for the design elements down there, but then letting each individual restaurant really make their interior of their space their own. So, um, also, when the, if, if the variance is approved at the state level, social distancing and other rules will continue to apply. Um, so social distancing protocol is required at this time for any business that does open. Um, we've got the social distancing protocol on our website now if any business needs to download it and, and place, it should be in a visible place at every business. Again, six feet of separation 
Masks are required indoors and outdoors and social distancing requirements cannot be met. And then for the best information that's out there to guide us through the orders as things change is the resiliency roadmap put out by the governor and it's a state issued guidance for industry standards. So as different industries open up, such as restaurants, I think there's a eight page document out there of exactly what uh, protocols restaurants need to be following in order to open within the roadmap. So that's available at COVID-19. I have the web page up on this slide. In terms of timing for this to occur, um, tonight we're looking for council to give direction. If council directs uh, the emergency, the director of emergency services to issue an emergency order, that can occur after the, the meeting this this evening um, and then staff would develop applications for encroachment permits and also the um, special permits that we've discussed. Businesses must apply for an encroachment permit with proof of insurance so as they're moving into the street more insurance would be required or proof of insurance and then the state would have to approve the county application for uh, moving further into phase two and once that has happened, staff can install the street barriers and start working with the, um, the restaurant owners to, to build out the area along the Esplanade and throughout the village. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Our recommendation tonight is to make the determination that all hazards related to the worldwide spread of coronavirus as detailed in Resolution 4168, adopted by City Council on March 12, 2020, still exists and there's a need to continue action and also to provide direction of, for, for business recovery, identify which concept to, to consider for the village, establish a test period of four months to allow businesses to recoup costs. This would allow the businesses four months at a minimum um, to have the outdoor dining area and recoup their costs and it would take us through Labor Day through September. Um, provide feedback on the pending temporary use permit order, so that's the takeout windows and the conversion of parking lots. And then um, also provide feedback on village parking to increase that to three hours, open cliff drive and the upper lots. And now we can move into public comment and I'll give it back to you, Jamie. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. I think before we go to public comment, uh, it's uh, council questions. Yeah, is there any council members that have questions? Uh, I see uh, council member Bertrand and then we'll go to uh, Vice Mayor Brooks and council member Story. Council member Bertrand? Yeah, for the uh, proposed um, uh, vehicle access along the Esplanade. Is the um, markings going to still work like for uh, cab pickup and the, the white zone for loading and unloading like um, people at the hotel and such like that? Or is it all going to be um, not available to the public and those who might need it? So under the BIA option, all of the parking that exists on the left-hand side of the road would continue um, to be in place. Uh, there is a request that with the BIA, a consideration be given to uh, give the hotel an allowance to park in other parts of the village um, because right now they currently are allowed to park in that first segment that would be taken by the um, restaurant. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the hotel definitely needs some special allowance. Um, the experience of being in, at a hotel is, you know, something to look forward to. Costs a lot to rent a room, but to have loading and unloading to be an owner's task sort of takes away from that experience. So I'd appreciate any recognition of that situation. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, we're going to move on to Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Katie, um, can you help me understand that for like regarding like the other businesses, for example, like Dharma's or something like that, or Eric's Deli, um, and 
in regards to the parking restrictions, you mentioned like what uh, if they have a large amount of parking. Does that how does that work? Because I mean, I guess, let me clarify my question. So if somebody has parking on a on a lot, would they be able to apply for this variance as well? Yeah, so it would be an administrative permit, and um, so I shouldn't say just large parking lots. It's really anyone that has a private parking lot that they want to utilize for um, a restaurant use, they could apply for this temporary use permit um, through our office, and it would be reviewed administratively. And they would just, um, we would need to first set up what the, pro, what the um, stipulations are, of if it's a percentage of the parking area that can be used. But really, I think in these times, it's really important to be flexible. So making sure that applicants can come in with a solution that they think works and we can work with them to make sure that um, the solution does work if it's a shared parking area considering the other businesses in the plaza. But really, I think you do need to be flexible in these times. And my follow-up question, will, you, will there be a charge for this permit? So that is something that we could discuss this evening. Um, right now, and we do have a charge for administrative permits, and I can get that number for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next we have uh, Councilman DeSori. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess um, I have several questions. I wanted to start um, by going back and asking about the county applying for a variance tomorrow morning, and if that would it at all affect the beach closures, um, or would the beach continue to be closed until July the 1st? So in conversation, so, so nothing that the council, the, the Board of Supervisors is doing tomorrow will affect the beach closures. Uh, the beach closure is a separate health order that the health officer has issued. In verbal conversations with her, she has indicated that she anticipates that the beach orders that are in place today will continue um, indefinitely. So at this point, we don't have a, a planned end to the beach, uh, beach restrictions. Okay, so the application for a variance, um, they don't contemplate using that to open up the beaches further. Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Um, I want to do, um, what, and the other is ask about, um, and I guess for the lack of a better description, the, the Norton option or option two, is that what we're referring it to? Um, I was wondering if the BIA has had an opportunity to study it, uh, respond to it. Um, and then uh, I had some questions about, um, that option, it, 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 I think in your presentation, Katie, it, it appears to show that it would provide access to the Capitola Hotel, but I was kind of unclear how it would do that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll bring up the slide again. So the there is not direct access at this time that, or any agreement in place to the Capitola Hotel that I've heard of. I've, I've talked with the designer of this concept in the past couple hours, and it seemed like there was the ability to, to discuss that more, but no, um, no um, signed agreement in place that would give access to the hotel. So really the, what we would have control of as the city is this portion of San Jose Avenue and we could issue permits if we wanted to um, under this concept, permits for the hotel and you know there are quite a few residences in this, these two blocks as well between the Six Sisters and Lawn Way um, to allow them to park here. The, the other parking lot at the Mercantile is privately owned and operated, and at this time, there's no agreement in place to utilize that parking lot. So there's not a, a direct drop-off to the hotel at this, under this concept. And I, for your second question, um, I, I, I believe that members of the BIA are 
here and available to comment this evening on the phone. So I would I would wait to hear from them to hear if they've had time to understand the second concept because I'm unsure. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, it, it appeared to me that um, there would need to be other arrangements made out before this concept would uh, accommodate the Capitol Hotel, the Six Sisters, and, and the condominium there on the corner. Um, theoretically, maybe it's possible, but I think that uh, there would need to be more arrangements that would need to be made. Um, on uh, the BIA proposal, um, and I wanted to um, just inquire whether, um, and, and this goes to the nature of social distancing, um, because I'm, I'm concerned um, that if we don't, aren't able to open up those areas to pedestrians, that they will not be able to accomplish social distancing. Um, so I'm looking for ways to maybe try to maximize that. And, and on the BIA proposal, I wonder if um, they had considered or thought about, um, you know, closing part of the Esplanade down toward, you know, the beach pickup, down toward Esplanade Park, um, you know, that little road that goes around. Um, theoretically, could that be closed off so that it's open to pedestrians? Um, and if we maintain the drive-through, that it would only be on, um, you know, the, I'll call it the El Toro side. Um, so that's it. And so I would just like to put that, put that out there and see if that can maybe be studied further. Um, so those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, uh, we have Council Member Bator. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just have one uh, question on the uh, on the map that was drawn by uh, the BIA, and my concern is that it appears that they've overlooked um, parking for Bella Roma and Cork and Fork, and I just wanted to know, is that just an oversight, and is that something that can be uh, quickly remedied? I think... Um they considered Cork and Fork and they have some outdoor dining, but I, I believe that could be quickly remedied. If um, I think uh, Bella Roma was, was an oversight, so good catch. And that should be quickly remedied. I spoke with Katana today. He's interested in three parking places and Cork and Fork was looking for two. So okay. If, if you could add that, that would be, that would make that plan complete. So thank you. Great. All right, uh, seeing no additional questions from Council, we'll be back for, for comments from Council in just a moment, but for now we're going to open it up to uh, public comment on this item. There's one City point, Manager? I apologize for interjecting. I just wanted to, one of the points that was raised by Council Member Story, and I wanted to be, this is a pretty strange nuance, and I think it's important for everybody to understand, but the current beach rules don't allow people to sit on what they call beach parkways um, at any time in the day. So beach parkways are only open for active recreation. And under the way the county health order is written, a beach parkway is described as a street or a path that is immediately adjacent to the beach. So I've talked to the county a little bit more about this and the county council and City Attorney and I have also discussed it, and we believe that that means that the Esplanade, essentially between um, the Zelda's deck and the park, is a beach parkway. So I just want everyone to be aware of that as we think about that section of the Esplanade for a potential closure. It, it doesn't lend itself to having seating under the current health orders from the uh, from the county. Great. All right, so we're going to move on to public comment. Uh, public comment period is now open for this item. If you'd like to make an oral comment, please raise your hand by dialing star six or using the Zoom raise hand feature. Uh, we're also taking comment by email, so let's start there. That's the, uh, probably going to be the quickest and easiest comment. So let's start with the city manager. Um, have there been any emailed public comments on this item other than the, um, the ones that we've received as, as additional materials? 
I think I need uh, Community Development Director Katie Hurley to stop sharing her screen so I can get to the email. Thank you. So we do have public comment. It looks like I have um, three, four different emails from three individuals. Maybe, maybe one's a repeat. So should we, I will share the screen and would you like me then to have them read? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Okay, so here's the first one. Can people see this on the screen? We can't hear the uh, the screen reader though, Jamie. Okay. We can see it, but um, we can't hear it. Let's see if we can get the volume up. Otherwise, I'll just read it. Okay. Let's start again. And thank you, Mayor and Council members. As many businesses in the village depend on out-of-town guests staying at hotels and vacation rentals. Do we have any urgent planning for opening up hotels and vacation rentals similarly to allowing dining on parking spaces, etc.? Sean Fidock, Code General Manager. Shadow Brook Restaurant 1750. Okay, so that's comment number one. Comment number two. Hello there as a business owner and resident of the Central Village. Option 2 is a horrible idea as we need access to the village and this would be a massive headache. People that don't live here may think it's great, but actual local residents of CB do not like this. Business owners sometimes need to go in or out of the village several times a day to get products or run errands. That is why option 1 is the best bet. It allows the best of both worlds, dining near each restaurant as the map shows, plus parking for city revenue and access for cars and emergency vehicles. Plus option two would be more destructive to the mercantile as we have two parking lots that would essentially be closed and we have also lost revenue for the last 67 days. This will not work. Thank you. Josh Fisher. Owner, Left Coast Sausage Works. Owner, The Daily Grind Coffee and Bottle Shop. Manager, Capitola Arcade. On-site rep, Capitola Mercantile and Pay Parking Lots. President of Stockton The Vape. Sent from Yahoo. Okay, and then it looks like we have two of the same. And we'll read this one. Hello. When will vacation rentals be able to be rented? Also, we really hope that Capitola will start rating the beach and improving the appearance of the beach. Even if you can't open the beach, it doesn't look good. And for the sake of all of the businesses and trying to help them, the beach needs to represent the amazing city Capitola is. The beach is almost not walkable as it is right now and with the Junior Guards program participating concern for people to get hurt. Thank you. Thank you. Bill and Julie Kenny. Okay, this looks like the same one. Okay, so those are the emailed public comments. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to turn over now to our moderator, uh, Larry, and if you could uh, Larry, will you be unmuting individual um, uh, participants, or will I be calling on them? Uh, I, I can I can unmute them in the, the, the in the order that they raise their hand. If that works. Okay, and you're going to call them out so they know that they're on. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Great. So the first speaker, Dennis Norton. I'm uh, un allowing you to talk at this point. You have three minutes. Dennis. It, it's. He's muted. He's yeah, we, we can unmute him from our end, though. Uh, no, he's. I think he's up. Oh, there we go. Hello. Go ahead, Dennis. Can you hear me out? Thank you, thank you, Council, for hearing this tonight. Um, in, in reality, um, our plan is significantly different than the BIA's, and we did not start this program until we went down and talked to um, uh, all of the restaurants in the village. And uh, we have a completely different interpretation of what the BIA is coming up with. But I'd like to bring up a couple things. First of all, um, social distancing, which has been discussed previously by Sam, is not possible when you bring cars into that parking lot. There's, there's actually plenty of room in the village for the number of people who have come there. 
The difference is, is we've been taking them up when two thirds of our whole village is filled with automobiles. So it's impossible safety wise to park cars into the village and do it. Um, just in a correction of Katie's uh, announcement, um, our proposal does not allow cars into the village at any time except for deliveries and for emergency vehicles. We are allowing San Jose um, Avenue to be free of cars and allowing for parking for the Capitola Hotel and the local residents only, and including it gets access to the to the mercantile parking lot that uh, Josh was mistaken on. So you would have access into that parking lot. Um, the proposal that we have um, is a plus for the whole community of Capitola as well as the village. We certainly are concerned about the restaurants, and we actually, as much as anybody, started this whole drive to, to, to protect them. But also, we have to think of our own community. Can just use your imagination here. One road going through the Esplanade, how does it back up onto, onto Stockton Avenue, Capitola Avenue? We would have the same mess that we have in the last two weekends. If any of you have been down there, it's been a nightmare. And that's why the city had to close it down once. The only solution to this is to keep all cars out there, open the two remote lots, and ask people to walk from from the remote lots down in the village. Yes, there are people handicapped. We can provide for handicapped by using the city hall lot and a number of other places. But the other thing that it does, it opens up the commerce to the upper village and outside of the Esplanade for businesses such as all of them that you walk by coming from the upper parking lot down into the village. It's not a handicap. You don't advertise this open. You're going to get some more people, but not a whole lot more. But the first thing you have to tell people is you cannot drive and park on the Esplanade. It should be that that area should be completely car free. The other issues we have, and this is considerably different, we're asking we're asking for something for the whole community, not just for the for the restaurants and, and the BIA's concerns. We want to open open the Esplanade Monterey Avenue to Capitol Avenue to pedestrian traffic only, allowing morning delivery and emergency vehicles access the whole time. Um, I've explained San Jose Avenue will be open up to two, two Caruso's and they're back. We allow the rest, restaurants to expand on the sidewalks and onto the street and onto the street in a, in a way that maintains a clear walkway. I think the only way to block a car from people sitting in those restaurants is to have hard barriers. You can't put those bench there. Can you imagine sitting on a bench right there and a car is stacked up and idling right behind you? It doesn't work. You need a hard barrier, and that's what Public Works has suggested before. Um, we open we open both our parking lots at Pacific Cove. We direct everybody that comes into town that wants parking to go into it. it. Takes us out of the present problem of everybody parking down in our neighborhoods. We create signage at the parking lots and other appropriate locations, reminding all visitors of required norms based on the county health recommendations. In other words, we tell people when they come into town, they wear a mask, and that, that the requirements are for social distancing stays in place, and we, we, we hold them to that. We can take we can make we can make regulations behind the beyond the county health standards. If we want to keep our village safe, we need to do that. We need to we need to find ways to promote beach access for water sports during close times. Um, I need, get, sir, need, you're out for three minutes. If you could wrap it up for us, please. We need to promote shop local campaign, and we need to organize and support local volunteers that will help the Capitol Police Assistant that can help monitors in the village. We have a completely different plan, but it's the safest plan for our community, and nobody has to give up things. The businesses will be more successful in the village, and our community will be a nice, much nicer place to live. Remember, remember that locals walk to the village. We're doing this for the locals as well. So that's, that's the start. And I've written you a couple letters, and you have the information. You have my map up there. If anyone has any questions, I can answer what you know, anything that you want to know on that map in there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll bring it back to um, to Larry to help us uh, get our, our next public speaker. And I believe they're gonna, um, they're gonna get the buzzer in the council chamber going. So you should be able to hear when your three minutes is up, I think is, is what they're gonna be doing. Okay, so uh, Hannah Smalltree, um, you can talk now. You need thank to unmute. You. And uh, thank you. Am I unmuted? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of working for our local businesses, I can tell you're giving this a lot of thought and you're really uh, doing a lot of good things. So thank you for presenting it so clearly. 
so that we can understand. Uh, the bottom line is I support anything we can do to accelerate responsible reopening. To Mr. Norton's point, the village is always crowded. The difference is our businesses are not getting revenue. They're losing revenue. We're losing culture, and we're making this, this economic impact that's being felt every day. So I support the first concept that the BIA has recommended for outdoor dining and curbside. I understand this is the recommendation of most of the local businesses and restaurants. This plan balances the needs of our businesses, our residents, our tourists, our visitors. So I support what the BIA is doing and all of the responsible planning that's happening now. Uh, we've worked really hard, we've kept our numbers low, but now we really have to look at what's happening to our local businesses and our restaurant in downtown. So I'd like to see our businesses be able to open up, make that revenue, and get back to the, the culture that we all enjoy and the reason that we live here. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Dharmesh Patel. Hello, uh, can you hear me? So, uh, the, uh, some, given the, uh, the, two the two plans that were presented today, um, obviously uh, we own the Capitola Hotel, um, which has been talked about uh, a few times here tonight. Um, so, you know, I can give you our direct comments in regards to how that affects us uh, specifically when it comes to these two uh, proposals. Um, we were consulted by the, uh, with the BIA proposal and was able to give uh, feedback and, and comments regarding that and, and our concerns, um, which uh, for the most part it did address, um, and I can go into that a little bit more. Uh, the second proposal, um, where it's completely closed off, um, I, we weren't contacted in any way or given any consideration. Um, you can see that uh, it completely blocks off our hotel from any access whatsoever by guests or vehicles. Uh, it also does not give us access to the front lot of the Mercantile um, at all, uh, which is where we have three spots that are off street that we lease um, at great expense. Uh, uh, for our guests, and we uh, would not have access to that under that proposal because it's completely blocked off, um, as you'll see on that map. Uh, so, um, I, you know, there's no way we could support that second option. Um, it completely uh, would devastate our business uh, in an environment where we're already devastated um, and impacted greatly by the, the by the pandemic. We're doing all this, uh, and I'm assuming we're doing all this tonight to find a way to. Uh, get the economy going again for the business owners in uh, the village um, and not an opportunity to, you know, create some other agenda to, to push forward, but uh, try to figure out a way to get economic recovery going in the village. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, we would support uh, the first option. Um, given that, though, we would have still have major concerns in regards to parking. It, do, it does seem, though, that we would have uh, still access to parking along the front of the hotel, which is great. Um, but one of our major concerns is still the fact that we would have no ability for loading or unloading of um, uh, customers as they come in for checking in. Um, so what we would uh, like to request, a few things here, if we do move forward with the uh, first option, is that, um, one, our permits be uh, adjusted so that we can park, um, have our uh, guests park anywhere within the village with those permits because the 50 spots that are being taken out is exactly where the bulk of our guests would park normally. Um, so allowing them to be able to use those permits in other areas of uh, the village would be uh, one thing. And then also creating a dedicated loading and unloading zone right in front of the hotel so that guests won't be backing up um, or causing any uh, backups along that narrow uh, driveway between the outside dining and the hotel. So um, those would be things that we definitely would want to get. Thank you for your comments. Larry, do we have any additional? It doesn't look like we have anyone else with their hand up, but I'm gonna leave it to you to be the. I, I don't see any other hands up at this time. Oh wait, no, that one just, just came up. All right. So, okay. Here we go. Uh, Nathan Cross. Nathan, you, you need to unmute. Uh, 
He's still muted, I think. Oh, here he goes. There I go. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, City Council members, for taking this um, issue in, in, you know, into, into consideration. Um, I, I know that our hearts are with keeping the village as beautiful and unique as it um, possibly can be. There are a couple of things that concern me about uh, the proposals. I think they're very close to being um, working together to achieve the goal, which is to leave the Esplanade open for outdoor dining. My concern would be that by allowing cars and traffic during the day and in the evening, that it would back up the village, as you have noted, and I'm sure you've all seen that during the week or even on the weekends, you can barely get into the village down Esplanade. But allowing for emergency vehicles and drop off and pick up for certain people, especially those who have are handicapped or need special access, would uh, be accommodated with the second proposal. The second issue is that if you reverse the access to the mercantile parking lot, you would then allow people to come in and that would be a pretty simple change so that the people in the hotel who needed to use that parking lot could, do, could use it. With the restrictions on the number of hours that are parked, you can park on the Esplanade being three, it seems to me that people who are using the hotel um, would want to put park in a place where they could leave their car and walk around and therefore using the mercantile or the upper village and maybe providing some kind of shuttle if they're unable to get into the hotel. But again, if they have access uh, because they're handicapped, it would be easily done. I personally don't see a lot of people being crazy about having cars drive by with, with uh, radios playing and, and, and being close to the, to the exhaust as they're trying to eat outside. I think we need to give the restaurants a break, and I think that the, mer the merchants in town would realize actually an uptick in the people who would come in, spend time walking around the village, going to dinner, and buying in the local, pro local shops. Our idea is to include or the idea of number two is to include access uh, to all people and to encourage people to shop locally. So please consider the idea of how you're going to shut down the Esplanade and see if you can't work out a compromise. Instead of accepting one or the other, having people come up with who we, who we vote in to come up with a, a compromise to make both work. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a tough decision, but I know you guys will do a good job. Yeah. All right, uh, moving forward. Larry, I don't see any additional public comment. Can you confirm? I, I do not see any hands up. Um, I would like to say something, but I don't know where the hands up button is on the Zoom. All right, no problem. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Karen. Um, well, thank you for uh, spending so much time on this issue. Um, I would like to try and quickly answer some of the things that came up. Uh, no, the BIA was not consulted with uh, Dennis uh, and Molly's um, proposal, for one thing. Most businesses that I've talked to were not consulted, so um, we didn't really have any opportunity to give any explanation. A few of the people who signed letters and sent them in told me that they really didn't have a full explanation of what was planned. It was just sort of a general, oh, let's support the village. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll sign the letter. So I think that there's a lot of problems. The first and most important being that many of the restaurants, if you look at the, uh, compare the two maps, many of the restaurants would not have any area for outdoor dining under um, Dennis and Molly's plan. So that would completely leave them out. Um, as, uh, as Ed mentioned earlier, it was an oversight that um, Bella Roma and um, Cork and Cork at first did not think she wanted any additional space and then said she probably did. So that was a, an oversight and I was going to ask that uh, the staff have some flexibility in moving a parking place here or there um, to accommodate uh, the needs of, of the businesses. Not every business was able to specify exactly what they wanted in uh, appropriate time to get this done. 
So, um, so first of all, not not many of the restaurants would have uh, outdoor dining facilities. It isn't. Uh, we've asked them. It's not feasible for them to be two or three blocks away from their restaurant and expect to be able to wait on people in those spaces. Um, also, on San Jose Avenue, first of all, I don't exactly know. Once you've turned down there and parked, if you're a resident or a handicapped uh, parker how you get back out of San Jose Avenue. Do you back up all the way out onto Capitola Avenue? Clearly that's not gonna work. And you have to have a barricade across there or else all day long people who are used to turning on San Jose Avenue would do so. So I'm really not, I mean, I'm really not here. There's just so many holes in that project. Also, that there's a difference between people who want to walk through the village from the neighborhood and people who want who need to come from outside the area to specifically go to a specific store to shop or a specific place to dine. Not all of them are willing or able or have the time to walk two or three blocks to buy a greeting card or to buy something at, um, at the zero shop or uh, quick pick up some, something to eat at, uh, um, at the taqueria. Clearly we can't have curbside parking, give up more of our parking if we've already given up the entire Esplanade. I think that um, uh, Council Member um, Botoff has a, another plan to help ease the traffic, uh, keep it from being quite so um, con uh, congested. One more quick thing. San Francisco has dining in the street all the time. Very sophisticated people up there are sitting and enjoying it. Cars are driving by all the time. This is, do this is done in other places. Uh, this is not a unique problem um, for Capitola. So uh, please support the BIA's proposal of option number one. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna keep uh, moving forward. I'm just gonna confirm that there's no additional public comment. I know sometimes it takes a minute to find the right button and unmute yourself and all that fun stuff. So I don't see any. I don't see any either. All right. With that, we're gonna, um, we're gonna notice that uh, public comment for this item is now closed. We're gonna bring it back to staff and council uh, for additional uh, comments and a, and a vote by council. Um, council member Botorf had his hand up first, but I noticed that uh, staff, uh, our, our community development uh, director has her hand up also. So is there, is there a clarification or, or um, additional staff information, Katie? Yes, I just wanted to answer Vice Mayor Brooks' question. And for a temporary use permit, the current fee is $86. And also for an encroachment permit, the fee is $68. Great. All right, thank you. Uh, now we're going to move into council uh, comments, deliberation, and a vote. I see uh, Council Member Tron, or excuse me, Botworth had his hand up first, and then we'll go to Council Member Tron. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate uh, the time that uh, the BIA spent in, in, uh, in making the, uh, the plan and the effort they put into that, especially on such short notice. And I also appreciate the time that uh, uh, Dennis Norton and, and, and the large majority of residents who spent in, I think uh, Chloe said it was in excess of 50 letters. Um, I think what, what, what got confused here is, is uh, as long as I've been in this town, there's always been a long desire to close the Esplanade. And every time we close the Esplanade for events like the car show and the Art and Wine Festival, we all get a great feeling of what it's like to casually walk around. We just don't realize that there's a tremendous burden of that place on the businesses trying to get food in and out. Uh, and we forget about the fact that there's they have the families that live at 190 Monterey and those uh, and those uh, condos there. The hotel would suffers trying to get people in and out, and uh, and just the operations in the mercantile in general. So I, I realize the exuberance that there is. What a great idea would be to close the Esplanade, but unfortunately, that's a different item at a different time. What we're in right now is an emergency created by COVID that has completely disabilitated the, all the businesses being able to, to thrive. And, and the solution that the businesses want is to be able to move outdoors, to comply with social distancing, and still be in proximity to the restaurant. And, and, and as much as, you know, I, I look at it, how nice it would be to have Get Smart closed, it's just not the right time for that. Uh, there's too many things that, that, that make this awkward 
that, that, uh, that I can't even begin to consider that second option. Uh, the thing that I, I would like to throw into the mix right now, just as part of the discussion, is I, I, I see us right now in a position from the city that we don't have a lot of financial money to help contribute towards the businesses and, and, and their recovery, but I don't want to put any roadblocks up to alter that. So I would be in favor of waiving uh, uh, the encroachment fees and all other fees that are necessary to allow these businesses to get uh, to get uh, get up and moving. Uh, I would also like to extend the hotel, Capitola Hotel, whatever variances they need for their permit. If we're taking away the proximity parking for them, that they're allowed to expand where their residents were able to park. Um, other than that, um, I, I, I'm in support of uh, the BIA plan. The only thing I want to offer that the current kind of lightly touched on, which I which I've decided not to bring up at this time to confuse the issue, but I want to bring it up to to so it's something we can think about as we move forward. I think Dennis Norton made a very valid point about what would it be like to be sitting in an outdoor dining as cars are backing up, and we all know that we have a backing up problem in the Esplanade, and. What's causing that is we know people will wait for 10 minutes if they see a family starting to back up their car, they'll wait and block traffic for 10 minutes to secure that parking place. So since we're not going to have a lot of parking in the Esplanade because we're going to have restaurants seating there, I don't see this being as big of an issue until we get close to the other side of the crosswalk where, where Zelda's deck begins. In that case, we're going to have all the diagonal parking and all those problems again, and we could have the queuing up of traffic backing up. So an idea that has been floating around for as long as closing the Esplanade is an idea of creating an express lane in the Esplanade. And that express lane, if you look at the map, it would begin at where Zelda's, uh, uh, at, the, at the beginning of San Jose where we all know the motorcycle parking is. On that left-hand side of the street, there's 11 parking places. And if we were to remove those 11 parking places, as cars came out uh, across San Jose or made the turn from San Jose on to Esplanade. If you stayed in the left lane against the curb, we could designate that as a expressway, no parking, no stopping, which would allow cars to flow through to exit from San Jose and to get directly out onto uh, the Esplanade and up Monterey and out of town. Those cars that would be looking for parking would stay in the middle lane, which is existing, and they would queue up for parking places they want to, wait, would want to be waiting for. I'm not bringing that up as a suggestion at this time because I think what I'd like us to do is try this, see how it works. If we get a lot of complaints and we see the constant backing up and we get the, about complaints about fumes and gas, this is an option that has never been tried. It only requires another loss of 11 parking, lot, parking places but it would allow for constant flow through the village. In addition, I, the one other thing I do want to consider is I am in favor of reopening all the parking lots we have available, not just Cliff, but the upper and lower parking lots. We've got our battle with the beach and that will be an ongoing battle, but I think right now what we need to do is support business, support uh, uh, retail sales and dining, and that's in front of us. And those are my suggestions and I'm Looking forward to hearing other council member comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go now to council member Bertrand. No, I'm um, very encouraged by public participation, merchant participation, as indicated by the 60 plus letters that we've gotten. I think this is um, very healthy and I appreciate the discussion that's come about because of this. Um, there's two proposals, and I note that the BIA has, you know, done a significant amount of discussion amongst their members to come up with the proposals that they have. I think Dennis's proposal has been on the on the um, on the board for a long time, and there's some good points there too. And in comment on what Ed said, I'd like to sort of support business uh, proposal number one but with the idea that there'd be a constant ability to change as we see how conditions um, unfold. So maybe the express lane will be needed. We don't know. 
maybe other things will be needed as businesses realize they actually need more parking and we could adjust those things. So I would propose number one. Ed, you listed a number of things that would be, um, we'd have to go for, <laughs> like uh, moving back the uh, charge on the permits. I totally agree with that. There's a number of others and whoever makes the motion, I think should list all those. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, Council Member Story, I see you have your hand up and then we'll go to Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Peterson. And uh, I as well want to thank everyone uh, for putting their heads together and coming out with both these options. I'm sure that uh, we're going to um, select one of them um, and maybe a compromise version um, as Nathan mentioned. Um, and, um, I, and I also want to add um, what Council Member Borsoff mentioned about open up the parking lots. We should do that. Eliminating the fees, we should do that. Um, expanding the permit uh, for the Capitola Hotel, um, we should we should do that. Um, but here's one thing, though, that I'm still concerned about, and under even the BIA proposal, um, and that's the requirement for social distancing, um, which in my mind, and under this emergency, uh, is a health and safety uh, issue. Um, I do not, we're, we're talking about opening up um, Capitola um, and the only um, pathways for the pedestrians under the BIA proposal as presented is still on the sidewalk um, and that sidewalk is going to be packed. Um, I don't know what we are able to do our, I, I mean, I, I think that there are some places that we could uh, open it up. Uh, and remember also the beach is gonna be closed. So people uh, will not be able to distance on the beach. Um, they'll have to stay on that sidewalk. And I guess I would like to hear more about what staff's plan is to monitor that. Uh, are we well, gonna assume that responsibility um, or are there things that we could do in addition or uh, uh, maybe a compromise between these two proposals in that we could maximize uh, people's ability to uh, follow the directive? Um, I also, um, I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more about what I mentioned earlier about closing part of the um, the the road to traffic there along Esplanade Park. Um, it seemed like that would be viable even under the BIA proposal. It would still allow traffic access, um, uh, but it would also give uh, all the junior guards uh, and, and, the, and the people that are coming to the beach a little bit more room to be able to maneuver. Um, well, I would like, you know, maybe staff to take this um, and um, and maybe a little bit more discussion uh, with some of the um, residents there um, on the Capitola Hotel. It seems like, I mean, I don't that they could access their um, lease parking uh, up from the other side of the mercantile. I would also want to know if they're still going to be using the front for loading and unloading, whether that's going to back up the traffic onto Stockton Avenue. Um, so a few more questions. Um, I, I would like to see maybe a little bit more discussion um, on some of these issues uh, and have it come back to us at our uh, June 11th regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to see if our chief could speak to some of the safety matters that have come up. Um, I don't know if he's available to do so and what his take is on the Good evening, Mayor Peterson. Thank you for the question. 
Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, as it relates to safety, there's quite a... I think we're going to have to do a different sound. James, can you just walk with me now? Apologies, folks. I think there was just too much feedback trying to use a laptop in this room with the mic on. So Terry's going to go in the community room and he'll call in from there. No problem. Thank you. While he sets up, I'll ask my second question. And it's um, actually for Councilmember Story in regards to his comment on the Esplanade Park. Just kind of two follow up um, about what your vision is there. Are you referring? referring to closing it entirely so we would lose some of those parking spots and two what would it because you you brought up social distancing what would that space be used for um and kind of what if you could elaborate more on your vision so that's my second piece in, in terms of the questions and then i do have some comments by um mayor peterson okay um so we have um okay like uh, Chief Jonas is back on. Let's start with him uh, to answer your first question, and then we can uh, have the dialogue uh, with Councilmember Story and come back to you for the rest of your comments. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. And I hope there's a whole lot less uh, feedback, Jamie. Correct? Okay. Uh, and, and if I recall, Vice Mayor Brooks, it was a general question about safety concerns for both of the options. If I understand your question correctly. <clears throat> let me let me address some of those, uh, and I know we have uh, Fire Chief Steve Hall, I believe, uh, on here here with us tonight as well. That you might want to add his comments from the emergency uh, response fire department response. I'll start by saying the police department, uh, the entire department, is committed to working with, with uh, the business owners, council, uh, based on your direction to to make the, one of these options work, and, and we're excited about the uh, the opportunity going forward. Anytime there's a change to a street configuration uh, or, or the normal flow of an area, uh, it introduces uh, an amount of concern, safety concern from the police department. And so that's what I've been talking with others in staff to see if we can mitigate some of that concern. Um, directly uh, in response to I think council member stories uh, concern from the health side and social distancing. What we've learned for the, over the last couple of months being uh, out in the community and trying to enforce or at least gain compliance with some on the health order um, is that folks that are typically walking and moving on the sidewalks are doing a really good job with their social distancing when they need to. If they're from the same household, it's a, it's a different uh, action, of course, we know that, but uh, they're often wearing their masks when they're moving about on the sidewalks. Where it becomes a significant problem and it's getting worse is when those same people come to a gathering point, wherever that might be, by the seawall, uh, out in front of a store. Uh, when they stop moving, then, then the social distancing requirements kind of break down. Um, it's one of the concerns I have for option number two is the full closure of the village, uh, in my opinion, is going to create a, an experience, probably a wonderful experience, but it's also going to introduce a higher level of gathering, public gathering, which, which causes us concern from the health side, of course, for all of us. But more specifically for me, from an enforcement perspective, because it's difficult with our limited resources to handle those types of health concerns and there might be that level of gathering. Um, the other safety concern that is significant um, in, in these options is the emergency response if needed or either PD emergency personnel or fire emergency personnel. Um, in option number one, um, in talking to uh, Steve Jesper, I'm comfortable with the distance, the width that remains for vehicles to safely pass through the escalator when they're making that right turn off of Stockton. Uh, and for those vehicles to continue moving forward, as Councilman Bottles mentioned, they won't be looking for parking until they get, until they get down past the elders. So that helps us out from emergency access. If we had to gain emergency access to the uh, Esplanade with this a little bit more restricted area, I think that it's a whole lot easier. Well, I know that it's a whole lot easier in option one than it might be in option two. 
Option two would require a rather uh, meticulous emergency response plan to ensure that a couple of things are in place if there's a response to a fire, uh, a response to another emergency, police or fire response. Uh, we would have to be able to first uh, remove some barriers effectively, quickly. We would have to be able to get police re uh, resources into the venue to clear the area of pedestrians, potentially of dining areas. And then we would have to have the right number of police resources to escort fire in. Uh, and so there are some safety concerns. I think all of them can be mitigated um, with significant and ongoing discussion. Um, there are a higher level of concerns for me in option two than there are in option one. Uh, and I'd like to turn to, if Chief Hall is here, maybe Jamie, you can see if he's here, or Mayor Peterson, and see if you'd like to add some comments. Thank you for the question. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Chief. All right. Jamie, I don't believe our fire chief is with us today, is he? I believe he was he calling in potentially. Right now. Oh, there he is. Yes. There he is. All right. Okay, he's ready to talk. He's just on mute. There you go. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, members of the council and staff. Uh, Steve Hall, Fire Chief for Central Fire. Uh, first of all, I want to applaud the city for uh, looking outside the box and, and you know, getting our, our city back open with the, the merchants and the restaurants. Uh, I think that's a very valid approach to uh, revitalizing our, com our community. I do have a few concerns in regard to access, uh, especially in regards to option two. When I hear the term hard closure, uh, it makes me extremely nervous in regard to maneuvering our apparatus into an area, especially when we have numerous structures, residences, and operating restaurants, and can't get close enough to do our job. Uh, whatever the need for us being there may be, it, it may not be a fire, but it may be a life-threatening medical event that we need immediate access to, uh, which is proximate to the victim. Uh, we have to be able to get our equipment in quickly, and we have to be able to be close enough to make sure that the equipment that we need is in fact available to us without having to uh, go a great distance to, to acquire more equipment. Also for this uh, option, if we were to close the entire area, as council knows, we have no lifeguards on the beach this summer. And I know the beaches are closed at this point uh, for the most part, but we still have people in the water. If if our rescue swimmers and our aquatic response personnel can't access the esplanade to gain access to the beach, to gain access to the water, that's another uh, a problem for us as far as uh, response times. So I, I do like the uh, BIA option, option one. I think that the, the fire department can work with the city and the planners on making that option uh, a viable approach. And I ask that you, uh, you consider that as far as what the emergency response could or could not be with any other option at this point. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, Mayor Peterson, may I ask a follow-up to that? Yes, of course. Um, so in the BIA, pre BIA presentation, uh, they talked about the options of the dividers or kind of the barriers of in between. Do we feel confident that's going to be enough at this time? Thank you again for the question, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. The barriers that the restaurants would be utilizing to section off their outside, uh, outdoor dining areas, is that the question? Correct. Yes. I think that that is a viable design to both uh, allow for the clear direction of the vehicles passing through while at the same time protect, protecting those people who are choosing to dine out at the restaurants. Um, I think the configuration with the benches in conjunction with um, what, what I understand is might be a six foot gap between from one bench to another and then some stanchion. Uh, I think that that will work. Uh, the reality is that if we go forward with that type of an option, uh, the police department is gonna have to be um, um, involved to a good extent on the front side, probably and likely providing some direction to the businesses, to the public, pedestrians and vehicles uh, through our, our uh, active work and our visibility out there so that the community and the visitors understand the changes 
and eventually uh, that the passage will be a whole lot more fluid um, and, and a higher level of safety um, as we move forward with, with either plan. But to answer your question, I do think that that's a good design. I think it's similar to other designs that I've uh, seen in other cities, and I think that it will work effectively for us here in Capitol. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Vice Mayor Brooks? Yeah, in regards to safety, and then I had that follow-up question for Council Member Story. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and, and have, I see that Council Member Story and Council Member Botswarp also have their hands up. So let's have uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, let's have you um, discuss with Council Member Story and get your questions asked. And then I, having gone through all the Council Members, I would like to make a couple comments and then we'll circle back around to Council Member Story and Council Member Botswarp. Okay, should I complete my comments then now? Mayor Peterson as well? Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead and, and wrap up on, on your end. Okay. Will do. So, um, you know, this is really some interesting times. As we try to revitalize our economy, we're still experiencing a shelter in place. And so there's a lot of give and, and take in, in this particular situation. So I most certainly appreciate everyone coming together and being creative in, in what we can do now. Um, so my comments are, I, I, it are, is, my priority here is safety. So I appreciate uh, our chief and, and fire chief uh, Steve Hall for making those comments in, in regards to option number one. I'm in agreement with um, that, you know, right now might just not be a safe option or safe right now for us to even consider option two. Um, I, I agree with Council Member Botworth that we should waive the permit um, cost and we should open both of the parking lots. Um, in terms of flexibility, like um, Karin Hanna suggested, if we've missed anybody, I think it's important that we circle back with them and give them an opportunity to come forward um, to have access to those permits and um, and just have a voice in as we go through this process. This is a test run, and because it's a test run, as Council Member Botswork suggested, I think it'll be important that we circle back in a few months on how it's, how it's going. Um, I'd be interested in hearing back from the BIA as well as PD on their, their take on things as it's we enter our summer months. Um, so most certainly, I like the slow street concept um, that the BIA is presenting. We, like Karen, Karen said, we've seen this in San Francisco, and we, um, I see it. I've just read some articles recently about Vancouver adopting these ideas. So it's happening, and we can look to other cities uh, for additional ideas. I think it'll be important to up our signage. I didn't hear any mention of signage um, in the presentation and maybe it's just was skipped over. So I think that will be really important for us to lay out what is allowable and what isn't. Um, and, and in regards to closing it off entirely, what's really important for me in, is that people of all abilities have access to, our, to just view the beach. And so being able to drive through for some people that I know, they're only that's their only thing that they can do is to drive through and look at our beach. If it was closed off right now, they wouldn't be able to do that. And that's, that makes me really sad. So it's important that everybody of all abilities have access to our beach and, and if it's just driving by. Um, so that's why I'm um, in agreement with option one. Um, Council member Bothorf also, also slightly um, touched on design concepts and Katie, mentioned it too with the ropes and the nautical design. I really want to stress um, the importance of continuity on that design so um, that we don't piecemeal this all together. Um, I, I hope that we can keep that in mind. And the last point was regarding the hotel. And I, I think that's fine that we adjust our permits um, for that. But I don't know if it was answered whether they're loading or unloading there. Um, I think we should move that option or that spot somewhere else so it doesn't interfere with um, with the moving traffic. 
I think I went through all my comments pretty quickly. So there you have it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, other council member, members, I see you have your hands up, so I'll, I'll be brief. I just want to get some comments in as, as well. Um, thank you to all of those who have reached out. I think uh, Chloe said uh, we got 64 uh, emails on this item. Um, and in looking back through my uh, emails, I responded to 56 of them. So I apologize to the eight people that slipped through, uh, slipped through the cracks there. Um, and in discussing this with a lot of business owners, it, it didn't occur to me right away that there was a divide between the idea of shut down the whole Esplanade for, for uh, outdoor dining or shut down some of the Esplanade for outdoor dining. Uh, my understand was that there was a general consensus of just support for outdoor dining and support for our businesses. Um, and so it, it took me somewhat by surprise that there was something of a divide between whether we shut down the entire Esplanade or part of it. Um, I have been in support of, uh, as we've gone through this process and received a lot of comments, I've continued to say I support shutting down the Esplanade for restaurants. I'd love to see that. And then in seeing the BIA option, it seemed um, really quite brilliant that we have the opportunity to support these restaurants and provide um, the space that they need for outdoor dining while still allowing for the drive-through uh, option, which as Vice Mayor Brooks mentioned, you know, maybe some people that's the, the only opportunity they get uh, to see the beach is, is just to drive by. Um, I, I am also in favor of the um, waiving of the permit fees and in providing uh, the hotel with the space they need to load and unload and for the parking for their uh, visitors. Um, in speaking with some of the um, businesses uh, and business owners, we had also had discussion about opening up the parking on uh, Cliff and increasing the, um, the hours on the meters and opening either one or both lots. Um, the discussion I had had previously was about a compromise in opening one, but clearly, you know, um, if it's consensus of the council, I'm not opposed to, to the opening of both. Um, that being said, I'm, I am very concerned about the social distancing aspects. Um, we saw, I believe it was a 20% spike in cases um, between uh, the beginning of May and, and now, um, just from the, the loosening of restrictions that we saw previously. Um, so I am hopeful that as we move forward, um, we can work with all of the business owners, all of the restaurants to ensure that they have the state's guidelines for what's required to reopen. I know a lot of the businesses need to have signs up that say we're going to have six foot of distance between each person. This is how many people are allowed in the shop. I think it's important that we provide the restaurants with that guidance as well. I know the, um, as uh, I believe it was Katie said, there's something like an eight page guidance for restaurant along with a, a full page checklist. So I think it's important that we uh, help provide access to that information um, because if we don't do this, I want us to open safely and productively, but if we don't do it safely, it can't be productive because we'll have an influx in cases and then we're gonna be moving backwards. And right now I can really feel the momentum of us moving forwards and that's exciting. Um, so to kind of wrap it up, I, um, I am in um, support of the, uh, the first option, the BIA option. Uh, I, I heard, I believe it was Council Member Story uh, mentioned bringing this back to us on June 11th. Um, and that to me is, I, I don't feel comfortable waiting that long to make at least some decisions on this. Um, as of last Friday, when I spoke with the county health officer, we didn't even think that the county board of supervisors would be able to meet this week, that there would be enough time to get our uh, attestation for variance ready. And so to hear now that they're going to meet tomorrow, um, as our city manager mentioned, that could mean that the state will approve us by tomorrow night. It could mean the state will approve us on Monday or on Tuesday, uh, June 1st or June 2nd. And certainly that doesn't mean that our staff will be ready um, to um, grant these permits or that we'll have the guidelines for them. But certainly I don't want us to fall uh, nearly two weeks behind potentially um, by, by waiting to further consider these things that we can make some decisions on now. Um, so I think it's important that we make some decisions tonight and that at our next council meeting it come back to us um, for an update on how it's going uh, hopefully we'll have some permits issued by then. 
we'll know what some of the hiccups are and what we need to do to fix them. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly not comfortable just continuing this item until uh, June, June 12th. A lot of our business owners and a lot of our restaurants have waited a really long time um, to get some kind of relief. And I think it's our, it's our duty to, to help them find that uh, relief in whatever way we, that we can. Uh, I think that was all of my comments. Uh, but if not, then we'll come back to me too. In the meantime, uh, let's see, I believe Council Member Story had his hand up first, and then we'll go to Council Member Bottorf and Council Member Bertrand. So, Council Member Story? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Peterson. Uh, I just wanted to respond to uh, Councilwoman Brooks' question about what was my vision for the area around Esplanade Park. Uh, my vision was in order to accommodate maximum social distancing, that that area uh, down in the triangle be closed off the traffic so it's available for pedestrians um, to access and to be able to move with the appropriate distance from one another. Um, it's already happening that there are uh, many people that are down there um, I would say most of them are not wearing masks and they are not able to get to the street park. So um, that was my vision for down there. I'm not quite sure uh, why it's not being proposed to at least that part of um, the Esplanade to be closed off to traffic. Um, it's a, the pickup zone could be moved over to the other side of the island where the current parking spaces are. So then there would be that single lane uh, to accommodate, I mean, uh, even Councilman Borkoff's idea of an express lane. Um, who knows how quickly the, any cars would move through there, but uh, there still would be passage through there, um, uh, but we would be able to, um, in that area where most people congregate, that there would be uh, as much space made available to them uh, to be able to maintain their health and safety. Um, so that's, that was my vision. Um, and I was just, and I'm, I'm prepared to move forward with the BIA proposal at this point, but um, that if we're not going to um, consider closing off that part of the Esplanade, that maybe that part be considered and reviewed and um, brought back to us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. Um, I agree, you know, if it's, if it's not something that we're considering today, it's definitely worth considering at a, at a future meeting as we continue to adjust to um, what this, dare I say it, uh, what this new normal looks like. Okay, let's see, who was next? Uh, Council Member Bottorf. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I appreciate uh, your comments, Madam Mayor. I, I agree with them 100% as far as uh, how we need to expedite this, uh, this decision. Uh, our core business owners have been playing by the rules for way too long. They've been good. Um, you know, my concern over all this, I, I'm, I'm a little worried about the increase in the numbers in the county. I, I don't want this to come back on us. The burden is going to be on the BIA to really, really enforce the, the mask requirement. That's what's going to keep us safe. You know, when people are on the sidewalk, we're not going to be able to provide social distancing. I don't care how much room we have. We've seen the village, even during Art and Wine Festival, when it's packed, we're all in close proximity. So that is something we have to deal with, and that's why masks are going to be mandatory. Unless you're actually sitting at a table eating, you're going to need a mask on. That, that's just for the safety of everybody. And, and you know, if that we're going to have to advertise it. It's going to have to be first and foremost on the business's menu. But that's how we're going to get through this, and that's how we're going to thrive. Because without that, we're going to be in trouble. I, I'm, I have concerns about the triangle. I think that's something we should not close at this time. We have to remember that we have a surf community. We have a tremendous amount of people, parents, moms, dropping their kids off, driving through there. Uh, during the summer, in due regards, even though we only have two parking places for drop-off, it becomes about six or seven places. So that would totally plug up the, uh, the the access out of the building. So I'm really not willing to move on that, especially with the reason to, to allow a place, as the chief mentioned, we're gonna allow a place for people to congregate and that's what it's gonna become. 
so I'm not in favor of that. Uh, so with that, uh, with the comments of the, that the mayor made about expediting this, I'm willing to ready, ready to make a motion at this time. Uh, but I think I've heard all the comments that, 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 are, that I need. So my motion will be, uh, I'm going to adopt staff recommendation, which begins with item one, to make the determination that all hazards related to the uh, widespread spread of coronavirus in that resolution continue. Item two is to provide direction, which is I propose option one. And option one is going to include all the things I mentioned, which were opening all parking lots, returning parking to three hours, uh, allowing the provision for the hotel variant. And if there's a way to include in this, it's absolutely strictly masks will be required in the village if you're not eating. And that's my motion. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we will continue uh, discussion. So was that the uh, end of your comments, Council Member Bautorf, with your motion? Yes, it is, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so Jacques, I believe um, you were you were next, and then Council Member Story, uh, I'm not sure if you re-raised your hand or if it's still up from last time, but if it's uh, up again, we'll come back to you. Okay, guess not. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, council member, okay, it is council member Bertrand. We'll come to you and then we'll come back to council member story. Okay, great. So, um, I think this discussion has been pretty good. We've come up with quite a few ideas, things that were missed originally and were thrown in as, uh, Ed did. So I think this concept has been around for a long time to open up the village and people have traveled around the world, Europe or wherever you see these wonderful places in town squares or other locations near a beach where, you know, there's people just milling around, there's businesses open, people out in the square eating, kids, you know, the whole works. I've seen them all over Europe myself in Japan and China. It's just wonderful atmosphere. It brings people together, makes the village alive. So for us, we've never really had the opportunity to do that except when we have a certain celebration. But now we have a real opportunity to save our businesses and to save the future of Capitol so it's a vibrant place for people to come and visit, enjoy the beach, bring their families, and come away with a wonderful experience that they tell all the people that they know and they come back every year. So to me, this is something we have to do. The first stage, obviously, to me, is encapsulated in option one. There may be changes as we move forward, and I mentioned that earlier. There may be things that we realize don't work. We will realize things that we need to improve on this, and I think every single member of the city council has mentioned this in one way or another. We'll come back around, look at new options. As we get experience with how this is going to work, then you know we'll have those ideas and they will be obvious. So we're going to have to have some way to revisit this every two weeks or every month or something of that sort. I think the other thing that's gonna happen is as every single merchant puts out their tables, as every single merchant wants to put out their wares or anything else of that sort, there's gonna be something of pride. The various restaurants, they're gonna to wanna to have a good show. They wanna show how good the restaurant is. People are gonna see it as they immediately walk by. I think it's gonna be an amazing experience for anyone that comes to Capitol. Everyone is gonna see what the merchants and what the city of Capitol can do. I think it's truly gonna be an amazing thing. And to some extent, once we do this, it's not going away. We're gonna be changing how the city does things downtown. This is gonna be something that is gonna be an experience that is so positive, so wonderful for everyone that comes and visits that this is going to change how we do things in Capitola moving forward. So I commend the BIA, I commend everyone else, and Dennis Norton, everyone is put into this planning and to try to come up with ideas that are gonna work. It's gonna improve. Whatever we do now is gonna look different in two, maybe three or four weeks, and we're gonna come up with things that will be truly amazing. So that's why I support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. And then we are going to go to council member story and then to vice mayor Brooks. Yeah, thank you again, mayor. I just wanted to get clarification um, on the motion. Um, 
and whether part of the motion was to have the city um, police force or the merchants enforce um, mask wearing among all the residents and visitors down to the Esplanade or, or the city as a whole? I was unclear about that part of it. As, I'm sorry, Councilmember Story, are you asking if that's part of the motion or if that's currently required by the health order? Because my understanding is that it's currently required by the health order to wear masks and that businesses and restaurants are expected to deny customers who don't have one. Right, but I, I, my question was outside of uh, the businesses. Oh, okay. When they're on the sidewalks, when they're walking through the village or anywhere in Capitola, yes, I understand that the health order is... Uh, um, stating that people should wear masks. But the fact is that um, I'd say most people do not wear masks. Um, and I'm just wondering what the intention of this motion is concerning that reality and how we may turn that around. Okay, uh, I will go to, let's see, I think we should, um Let's see, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll, I'll turn to guidance from our city manager here. I think perhaps our police chief could give us some guidance on this and also council member uh, Bottorf that actually made the motion perhaps could clarify if he was including um, any kind of mask in the motion itself. Um, so where should we start here? I think I can reply pretty quickly. The, what I heard was emphasize that businesses were gonna be really called upon to emphasize the need to wear masks. So that would include probably signage at the front doors about the importance of masks. And I think that that is something we've been talking to the BIA about. And in fact, the city actually, we're developing um, some, I know this is outside the motion, but we're developing some banners that we're gonna to try to hang over the, the street that say, respect Capitol to wear masks, try to get that message out. So that's our staff. That's what that's what we heard as staff. And if I can add to that, that's exactly my intent. I'm not asking for any additional enforcement. I think this burden falls on all of us. I think the business has realized to succeed, Max are going to be able to get us through this. Uh, it, it was exactly as the city manager explained. So thank you for allowing me to clarify that. If I could jump in here, this is the norm. It's going to go forward. People are going to be respecting each other, especially when they come to crowded areas. Thank you. Thank you. So, so let's back up for a second there. Uh, Council Member Story, does that answer your question or no? Yeah, that answered my question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I believe uh, Vice Mayor Brooks is the last one with her hand up. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so I wanted to offer a friendly amendment to Council Member Bottorf's um, uh, motion. I didn't. I didn't hear the inclusion of waiving the permit costs in your motion, and so I just wanted to make uh, to offer. The, were you going to say something, Councilmember Bator? When you were done. <laughs> oh, okay. So I. Um, so my amendment would be to just ensure that we include the waiving of the permit costs, um, and that we circle back. Perhaps since this is just a four-month. Um, trial that my additional uh, request would that be a monthly check-in with the BIA and PD to come in and report back on how everything's going. So um, that would just be my friendly amendment to offer both of those, to add those additional items to your motion. Uh, thank you for that, Vice Mayor Brooks. My, the uh, waiving of the fees I mentioned when I first deliberated, but I, I omitted it in my motion. Thank you for catching that. And I definitely accept that. And I also accept the monthly evaluation as both you and uh, Council Member Bertrand mentioned, we should be evaluating this. I think we really need to meet in one month for sure and evaluate every every part of what we're deciding, uh, good or bad. So, so that, that Sunday amendment is absolutely fine with me. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for bringing that up. And yes, as Ed said, and I said, um, I definitely agree with these ideas. And so include that in the amendment. All right, so we have a motion and a second um, as amended. Uh, I don't see, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, is your hand still up for additional comments or was that from the last comment? Oh, did, did she freeze? I think she's frozen. I think she's frozen or she just has intense focus. We'll come back to her. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll wait a second because we're going to need her for the vote. So in the meantime, can we have um, the city clerk read back uh, the motion as, as she understands it? 
Yes. Thank you. So as I heard, the motion is to adopt staff recommendation with item one being determining that hazards from the COVID crisis still exist and item two, providing direction uh, um, going forward with the first option one proposal from the BIA, including opening all parking lots, returning parking to three hour time limit, allowing the variance for the hotel parking, waiving fees for all administrative permits, and including a monthly check-in with the police department and the BIA. That is what I heard. And the one other right. element I think was that the businesses needed to emphasize the importance of masks. Yeah. And if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think that's part of the um, part of the state's guidelines is that the businesses need signs up that say that you're required to have a mask and all that. So sorry, that's aside aside the motion. All right, council members, um, we are it, we have come to time for a vote. So uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, City Clerk, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Botorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Great news. All right, clap around. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your participation uh, in this item, for your public comment, for all of your outreach. Um, we're just getting started, so we'll continue to be in touch as we move forward. All right, moving right along. Uh, we're going to move to item uh, 8B, which happens to be an update. Uh, from the Central Village Wharf Business Improvement Area, BIA, as it is otherwise known. I'll turn over to staff uh, to kick us off. Sure, this item is on the agenda at the request of Council Member Brooks from the last meeting. And I, I do think actually the intent behind this was to really establish communications between the BIA and the council. And I think we have just spent the last two hours doing that. <laughs> so it may be that this item ultimately isn't necessary at this time on the agenda, but with that, I can turn it over to Karin and uh, we can hear more. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that vote as well. We're very happy. Uh, next month we have the uh, renewal, which answers questions about budgets and dues, so we don't need to deal with any of that. I do want to give a mask update. We are working, the BIA should in the next, perhaps hopefully tomorrow, we have um, some a, a variety of sort of cute and catchy reminders about masks that the businesses will have. They all know that they uh, need to require them. And I will say that as far as the visitors to the shops, they are very well trained. Uh, everybody who come, has come to our door today has their mask handy. They walk right up to the hand sanitizer, sanitize their hands, and they're looking around and trying to be respectful of other people. Um, so that, that's going well, but I agree that when people are out walking in the street, they definitely need reminders, and we'd like to continue to work with the city about any signage, um, anything we can do to help that. That's our answer, math. Um, so I can answer any questions if there's anything specific. We have three closures in the village so far. We have three pending closures um, that are coming, probably coming through in the next month. We have one new business that did extensive remodeling that hasn't been able to open yet. That's the uh, British Ales. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, this move tonight is really, really appreciated uh, to get uh, some a little bit of energy going in the village as some of the others are, are kind of near, nearing that, that edge. Um, and uh, we also really appreciate the staff's efforts in working with the BIA and also um, expediting the permit process um, going forward. So if there's any questions, uh, I'd be glad to answer them. Otherwise, I'll see you again next month. Thank you. Any council members uh, have any questions for Karen? Or just thumbs up? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, can I get a guidance from our city manager? Because this is a... Uh, uh, 
a report or a presentation, we still need to go to public comment on this item? Um, y well, yes, normally, but we don't have any public comment received on this item for, um, we don't have any public comment received for, on this item by email. Okay. Okay, not by email. So I guess in that case, I'll go ahead and just say this is the time for public comment. If any of the attendees uh, on this Zoom meeting have a comment on this, you can raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised at this time. Uh, great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Karin. Thank you uh, to all our BIA members. Uh, we are going to bring it back to council now for any additional comments before we move on to the next item. And seeing none, we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, item 8C, received Monterey Bay Community Power Presentation. And we'll start with uh, staff. So this is a presentation I think Lena came to a meeting about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, to give us an update about Monterey Bay Community Power. It's a joint powers authority of which the city of Capitola is a member. Uh, we are not currently on the board, although we are going to be getting a board seat back coming up early next year. So with that, I will turn it over to Lena for an update about what's going on at Monterey Bay Community Power. Hello, um, thank you for having me, um, city council members and community members. If I can go ahead and share my screen, I'd like to go ahead and provide you with an update um, of what we have accomplished since uh, we last met. You were absolutely correct. It was almost one year to the day that we had an opportunity to talk about um, the accomplishments of 2018 as a joint powers authority of Monterey Bay Community Power and Capitola's participation in that. Um, so as we move forward, just to remind anyone who just uh, is hearing about us for the first time that might be within the community, uh, we are a joint powers authority that's providing carbon-free um, energy to the Central Coast. And we have added a few cities. I'll go ahead and share a little bit about that as we go. Um, since the last time that we spoke, um, we started off, of course, with our original um, uh, 19 cities. And as you can see here, we recently added, of course, the cities of San Luis Obispo in Morro Bay. And we will have um, the city of Delray Oaks in Monterey County, in addition to nine other communities in San Luis Obispo County, joining us um, in total in 2021. In 2019, um, we were able to provide, of course, the community with a carbon-free offering as well as a renewable offering. And we ended the year at about not, approximately 94% of overall enrollment between our entire service territory. Um, 2019 saw another $12 million in energy program, um, a combined total of about $17.2 million in customer energy savings and um, the increase of a resiliency fund through a program called UPS. Some of our community members have heard about it as it did open um, up for um, public applicants already, um, providing um, resiliency for essential facilities um, to support maintaining your electricity during TSTS events or other emergencies. Um, contracted with um, local vendors in addition to adding full-time employees throughout our existing service territory, including um, down in San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay, where we opened another office. Um, we discussed last time around that we were able to actually increase our reserves. All debt was paid off in that first year, um, actively um, through 2019 and continuing now into 2020, we are working um, to build and actually receive a credit rating for the GPA so that we actually will have a little bit better pricing and buying power out there on the energy market. Um, the two um, options that were made available, um, as I mentioned previously, and are still currently available to our community, are um, MB Choice and MB Prime. And as far as energy procurement projects go, um, we are continuing to add um, to our renewable and carbon-free um, contract and power purchase agreement to allow for um, expansion into um, more local renewable energy options in addition to um, having the ability to meet the requirements that the state of California has for um, greenhouse gas reduction um, within California from three utilities and statewide. 
So uh, four Capitola numbers, which are pretty interesting compared to where we were last time around. Um, so we do have 5,803 enrolled accounts um, with about 95.73%, so above our enrollment average in the city of Capitola. And the city has actually saved over $3,000 on its own um, facilities and building accounts, in addition to having the community saving over $230 thousand dollars itself in total since enrollment or commencement in 2018 and then of course you can see over eight million pounds of greenhouse gas that we've offset so far just by your support out in Capitola. Um, I would like to share also um, a more recent update just in light of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, MBCP's commitment to actually meeting the needs of course of our community members we received unanimous support from our board to launch our response to COVID-19, which would provide 50% of um, deferred electric generation costs to all rate payers, regardless of rate classification. So it includes residential, commercial, and ag. 100% of enrolled customers will see a 50% discount on their um, energy bills in May and June. They don't have to apply for anything. There's no paperwork involved. We just lowered the rates for those two months so that folks can have an opportunity to get back on their feet as they're trying to get things going again. Um, I mentioned um, the Resiliency Fund program and that started um, with the launch of the public um, sector uninter uninterruptible power supplier UPS fund program. Um, we are working to also launch a commercial sector um, pro program or portion to this program as well later this year um, in collaboration with um, the Santa Cruz uh, Bank. So we have the 25 million total investment that's actually been set aside as a re revolving fund to allow us to provide resiliency um, to key critical facilities and support those um, battery storage and um, generator projects that are needed to help support the communities in the event of energy outages. This came um, directly from feedback from community members last year um, when the PSPS events were really in full swing. We had a great deal of our Santa Cruz County um, customers affected by those events. And this is, this is our response to that. And then we are continuing our advances to unify the Central Coast. As I mentioned, we have additional cities um, coming to join the Joint Powers Authority in January 2021, as well as a name change to Central Coast Community Energy also in 2021 to be more representative of our expanded service territory and the coastal communities that we serve. Um, uh, there's additional information here, of course, about the programs that I discussed. But if you have any questions for me um, or MBCT regarding any of these programs, of course, you can find us online. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lena. Uh, is there any members of the council that have any questions? Let me go over here so I can see if any hands are raised. Does not appear to be the case. Uh, Mr. City Manager and Larry, our host, do we have any uh, emailed public comment or any attendees that have their hand raised for public comment on this item? We have no email public comment. Great. I do not see any hand raised. All right. We will bring it back to the council for any further comments. And seeing none, our action tonight was uh, just to receive the update report. So thank you so much, uh, Lena, for hanging in there for those last couple hours and, and uh, providing this update to us. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome, and thank you for having me. I'll see you guys again soon. Lena, thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, as noticed at the beginning of the meeting, we are going to continue item D to a future meeting. So we're going to move on to item E. Uh, consider options for ordinance temporarily prohibiting tenant evictions due to COVID-19. And uh, we'll go to a staff report. Bear with me for a moment here and I will share my screen. Okay. 
So council will recall that on March 16th, the governor released an order that granted cities the authority to place a moratorium, um, uh, for cities to place a moratorium on evictions in California cities for people who are affected by COVID-19. Uh, on the 26th, 10 days later, the city of Capitola, we approved a urgency ordinance that prohibited evictions in Capitola. And then the next day, the governor issued an order statewide um, that banned the enforcement of evictions for renters, um, for people who are affected by COVID-19 through the end of May. And then following that on April 6th, the California Judicial Council, which pr uh, um, puts out rules for the entire court system in the state of California, issued an emergency court rule that paused any eviction proceedings in the courts other than those that might be um, necessary to protect public health and safety. So all evictions, not just something uh, associated with the COVID-19 emergency. Um, the Judicial Council's rules was set in place to apply for 90 days uh, after the governor lifts the COVID-19 state of emergency or if the Ju Judicial Council were to adopt a separate rule. So our urgency ordinance will expire on May 31st and then that initial governor's order that the first thing the governor did which granted us the authority to, to do this urgency ordinance expires on the 31st. Uh, in the meantime, the California J Judicial Council rule that prohibits evictions to, from proceeding in courts uh, will remain in place and is at this point scheduled to remain in place until 90 days after the state of emergency at a statewide level is declared. So the recommendation from staff at this point is to allow the city's emergency moratorium um, to expire. Uh, we did prepare an alternative uh, and that really is essentially updating our ordinance to basically if the governor adopts a new order that grants cities the authority to continue these, that ours would automatically continue should the governor um, grant that authority to the city. That's a secondary alternative uh, recommendation if the council doesn't want to just let this expire. And I think with that, I'm available for questions. All right, are there any members of the council that have questions for staff on this item? Not seeing anyone raise their hand. So with that, we're gonna bring it to public comment. Um, Mr. City Manager, do we have any emailed public comment on this item? We do not. Okay. And Larry, do we have, doesn't look like we have anyone raising their hands, is that correct? I don't see anyone with a hand raised. Okay, great. We're gonna bring it back to council uh, for further discussion and uh, a vote. Is there any council members uh, that have any comments on this item? Looks like we'll start with Vice Mayor Brooks and then we'll go to council member Story. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, I'd like you to, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and make a motion to adopt the other um, recommendation presented by staff today to um, amend our ordinance extending the city's eviction moratorium past May if the governor issues an amendment to our new order. Um, and in addition uh, to include a letter from our mayor on behalf of the city in support of SB 1410. Uh, and thank you. If I may, this is Samantha, the city attorney. If I could jump in, I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting a motion um, so quickly, although I am appreciative. Um, there are a couple uh, changes that I would like to suggest be made to the ordinance. One is just a typo on my part. I put um, Sonoma, Sonoma County Health Department and I meant Santa Cruz County Health Department. And another is that uh, also a date should be changed from May 31st to June 1. I'll actually give a better description of those changes. The change from Sonoma County to Santa Cruz is on page 94 of the packet. It's the one, two, three, four, fifth, whereas clause down the page. The change from May 31st to June 1 is at the top of page 95 of the packet. Neither change is substantive. Um, they are both um, simply 
errors that I think add some clarity if we correct them. So if uh, Vice Mayor Brooks is open to including those changes in her motion, I would appreciate it. Yes, I'll go ahead and add those edits in my motion. Thank you. I'll second that motion with the changes. All right, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Brooks and a second by Council Member Story. Uh, Council Member Story, yours was the next hand up. Do you have additional comments? Well, I think I just wanted to add, um, you know, the Judicial Council order, I mean, it, it does um, freeze eviction, but it doesn't stop uh, landlords from issuing eviction notices. Um, it doesn't even stop them from filing unlawful detainer cases. Um, so I think that assuming that we get the governor's authority, um, this just adds another buffer to help alleviate the concerns and stress uh, among tenants um, and gives them a little bit more time to get back on their feet. Um, so that's why I support um, Councilwoman Brooks's motion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and Councilmember Bertrand, you also had your hand up? Okay, yeah, um, this wasn't a question about the motion, but um, I do have a question of our city attorney. Has there been any feedback yet in terms of um, the difficulties that um, landlords have had or how many people have actually talked to landlords and tried to adjust their, their rent rates? Uh, we had some discussion about that was being encouraged. So I'm just trying to get a, a sense of how this, you know, what we're, our initial action was and how that um, affected the community and some response and maybe also on a statewide level. I'm just trying to get an idea what effect this has had. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I do know that both tenant organizations and landlord organizations are lobbying um, the governor. This also goes to um, council member Story's questions about, or comments about what the governor might extend his order. Um, in response to your question, council member Bertrand, I don't know. I have not heard feedback from, about how this is affecting landlords. Perhaps um, city manager Goldstein might have some inside information on that. Um, it, to Council Member Story, uh, to your comments, um, we have, I have, I think a lot of city attorneys have been trying to find out any information about whether or not the governor intends to delay, to uh, extend his order. The last I heard today from some other, uh, from a county council up in Northern California was that he did intend to extend it. Um, the League of California Cities has not heard whether he intends to extend it, although they do know that he is aware of the League's um, request that he do extend it. So we are waiting to see. Thank you for your response. You for your response. I'm also, you know, the reason why I asked is because, if I may, Madam Mayor, sorry. Um, it's because I am concerned about the landlords. I mean, in a sense, they are small businesses too, um, maybe larger than some, but still they're in business for themselves. So I wanted to get an idea. And if, if you have some feedback later, I'd appreciate that being communicated. Thank you. All right. Um, Council Member Story, do you have your hand up uh, for your additional comments or is that from former comments? Sorry, that's from former comments. I'll lower my hand now. No problem. Just didn't didn't want to skip over you if you had more to say. No, thank you. <laughs> All right. Seeing no additional council comments, uh, we have a motion and a second. And someone uh, help remind me the way I'm keeping track of this isn't very high tech. So did we already take this out to to public comment? We did, correct? Yes, you did. We did. You did. Okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, so can we have a roll call vote, please? Absolutely. Council Member Bertrand? Aye. Council Member Bator? Aye. Council Member Story? 
Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, motion carries unanimously. And finally, item 8F, consider awarding a contract for the summer beach shuttle service. And we'll go to staff for a staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Steve Jesper, your Public Works Director. It's good to be with you tonight. I'm gonna to share your screen of a very short presentation uh, just to make sure I cover all the items here. Uh, the item before you tonight is to consider awarding the uh, beach shuttle contract that we operate typically uh, every summer. There we go. My apologies. Okay. I'm going to keep it at this level because that seems to be working. Um, in January this year, the city issued a RFP for proposals for beach shuttle operations. Um, as had been the case in previous years, we received one proposal from MV Transportation. MV has been the contractor for the last 15 years of our summer beach shuttle and has done a really good job. Um, this year, we have a new part to this contract, which includes providing shuttles for the Chamber of Commerce. They will pay for those extra shuttles for the Art and Wine Festival. Um, I realize it's not probably not happening this year, but it is in the contract. Um, in the past, they have tried to work a separate deal with MV Transportation, and the billing it all has always been mixed up, and it's been difficult to have MV working for two different agencies for the same uh, period of time for the Art and Wine Festival. So this year we included them in, Art and Wine has agreed to reimburse us. Based on the contract for this year, the annual cost to the city will be $53,430 for one season. Typically the shuttle bus runs from uh, Memorial Day weekend through the Art and Wine Festival in early September. Uh, this $53,000 cost to the city does represent a significant increase in the cost, approximately 53% increase in cost of the shuttle. Um, MV made it clear to us when it, uh, the end of last, last year's contract that they were operating in a loss and would not be able to continue under the rates they had been uh, going, uh, been using under their previous contract. So it was anticipated we'd see these costs. I can see the chamber's cost will be $12,906 for their portion of the um, Art Wine Festival. Um, as we were preparing this um, item and going through the, the contract with the contractor, it became evident with the beach closures in place and what up until tonight had been the closure of the uh, parking lots behind City Hall, the beach and village parking lots, um, that it wouldn't make sense to have the shuttle operating uh, this summer. I still believe that's true. Um, the village can only take so many people, especially with the beach closed. And uh, by opening the parking lots, I think we were providing enough service. Um, with the action earlier tonight to open both parking lots, I did quickly look at the guidance for transit operators um, that is available at the state level at least. And the operations do require them to restrict occupancy on the buses or the shuttles to approximately about 50% of their typical thing. So we'd be operating a 12 person shuttle at these costs. Um, it, it just, I don't believe that's efficient. And I think we should continue to uh, not offer the service in 2020. We have confirmed with the contractor that they, their agreement not to operate this year um, obviously, if we want to try and operate it, we would need to um, negotiate that reopening with the contractor. They, they probably would be, there might be some lead time for them to get ready. So with that, our recommended action tonight is to approve the shuttle service contract with MV Transportation for operation of the Summer Beach Shuttle with operations deferred until May of 2021. And I'll, I'll just add at this point, because I've failed to mention that this is a single year contract, but it includes options to renew for up to five years total um, upon mutual consent of both parties, the city and the MV transportation. It does include provisions for annual increases in the rates uh, consistent with the consumer price indexes and requests from MV based on fuel changes in fuel costs and operating costs that they may have um, 
may have incurred that we could negotiate with them. So um, that was my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, Council Member Story, it looks like you have your hands up for a question. Yeah, thank you again, Mayor. Um, Steve, uh, just out of curiosity, I, I was looking at the dual rate, um, uh, in essence, a separate and higher rate for the Art and Wine Festival. Um, and I, I see in the narrative it says it's just due to increased overtime hours. Um, but I, I didn't know why that's event specific. Wouldn't they just have an overtime rate and a regular time rate regardless of the event? Um, the number of vehicles, wouldn't that be covered by uh, vehicle operating hours? So just, you know, curious about that difference. Thank you. Yeah, Councilman Story, I, I share that question with you. Um, we asked that of MV Transportation because I, I didn't get an answer. I, I must admit they didn't give me the best answer. The answer they gave me was the, the overhead rates and just the overtime hours that they that the buses operate longer for the beach and shuttle than they do ours. I agree it should have been covered in there. Um, we did discuss this with the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, they were fine with that rate. So um, we didn't spend a lot of time trying to rene renegotiate that rate, but uh, um, their answer wasn't as crystal clear as I would have liked either. Okay, got it. I guess if the Chamber accepts that rate, um, if we shouldn't, uh, and they're the sole um, uh, contractor, I guess we just have to accept it. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just to be clear, we do operate two buses during the Art and Wine, and they operate rate five buses during the art and wine. So we do pay for two buses at that rate. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Council Member Bosworth if you have a uh, question. I just had a quick question. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Steve, you mentioned that we normally start the contract in, uh, on Memorial Day, and that's obviously passed, so we wouldn't probably start this till middle of June, I would imagine. So would it be just a little bit less than the, than the 53000 or? Is that the price included in starting at a later date? So the 53000 represents a full season. Um, but as I've, I mentioned in my presentation, we're not planning to operate it this summer. If we were to decide to operate it, say, starting at the end of June, middle of June, yes, the total cost would be less. Um, we'd pay on a per-day basis. Great. Thank you. All right, any additional questions? Seeing none, we'll bring this to public comment and I will turn to our city manager and uh, our host, Larry, to uh, let us know if there's any public comment on this item. So we have no public comment from email. I do not see anyone with a hand raised. All right, uh, with that, we will bring it back to council. Yes. And I believe, yes, this is just uh, receiving a report, correct? There's an action to approve the contract. Oh, my apologies. You are correct. All right. So back to council for a discussion and a vote. We have, uh, we are in a, a position to entertain a motion on approving this contract. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the contract uh, in essence to be effective for the summer of 2021. I'll second Sam's motion. Motion by council member Story, second by council member Bertrand. No additional comments. All right, we're gonna bring it to a vote then. Can we have a roll call vote please? Council member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Botorf? Aye. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Steve. And with that, uh, that brings us to the end of tonight's agenda. Thank you so much for staff, uh, to our staff for all the hard work that they've put into um, everything that they do every day all the time um thank you so much for that thank you to uh, those who have participated in our zoom meeting tonight uh, and all of our business owners and bia members 
Dennis Norton, everyone who has put in the time and effort uh, to try to collectively get us through this. Um, it is so greatly appreciated. Thank you, Benjamin, for being a uh, part of our, uh, being our technician uh, tonight, as always. Uh, and anyone else that I didn't get a, a chance to thank, we want to thank you, too. Um, and with that, that comes to the end of our meeting. Please take care of yourselves. Please take care of each other. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Good night. Good night.